I'm Rabbi Fry Mervis. And you're watching Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I want to watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're going to watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, everybody talk about Doug. Shalom and welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. We are here in Rosemont, Illinois at the Crown Plaza Hotel for the 10th anniversary banquet of the YU Torah Mitzion Kolel Dinner and honoring Rabbi Ruven Brand, the Rosh Kolel, his wife, Dr. Nechama Brand. And with us today is an amazing guest. It is... Uh, Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mervis from the British Commonwealth, who's going to be speaking to us, as you saw at the opening of our show, and he's with us as well today. So you won't want to miss this episode of Taped with Rabbi Doug. Stay with us. Rabbi Mervis is an ambassador and communicator of the beauty and the majesty of our Torah, and it is my privilege to call upon Rabbi Ephraim Mervis to address us now. Ladies and gentlemen, Valerie and I are so delighted to be here with you this evening to celebrate 10 glorious years of the YU Torah Mitzion Kolel, Yesha Kok, Rabbi and Rebetzin Brand, and everybody associated with this truly wonderful Torah initiative. A British Air Airways aeroplane was once flying from Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv to London Heathrow. And while the plane was still over the continent, the pilot came over and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, sorry to inform you that the whole of London is covered by a blanket of fog, and therefore we will need to divert and we'll be landing in Manchester International Airport, and from there we'll be providing buses for you all to get to London. Immediately after the announcement, an air hostess noticed a chassid dipping his hand deeply into his overnight bag. From there, he took a little black book, he opened it to one of its pages. He started to sway backwards and forwards, reciting some prayers, and she thought to herself, this man thinks that his prayers are gonna lift the fog. 15 minutes later, the pilot came over and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to inform you, the fog has lifted, we will be landing in London Heathrow as planned. At that point, the hostess went over to the chassid, she said, I owe you, an apology, he said, whatever for? She said, you know, your pair, prayers. He said, well, what about my prayers? She said, they were amazing. He said, no, they weren't amazing. She said, don't be so modest, they were incredible. He said, my prayers didn't work. She said, what do you mean? Well, I'll explain to you what I mean, he said. You see, he said, those prayers of mine, they were not prayers of supplication. They were prayers of thanksgiving. You see, he said, I live in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, tonight we offer two types of prayers to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. First of all, Tzfilot Hoda'ah, prayers of thanksgiving. To thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the Siyata Dishma provided during the past glorious 10 years of the Kola. And to enable this outstanding Torah institution to succeed in such an epic and dramatic way. And we also offer Prayers of supplication, tefillot bakasha, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should enable the kolel now to go mechayel el chayel, from strength to added strength. We are currently reading in our parashiyot shavua about the establishment and the furnishing of the Mishkan. And there is one item in the Kodesh HaKodashim which raises our eyebrows. It was the Kruvim, those cherubs. A three-dimensional figure of a little boy and one of a little girl facing each other, emerging out of the kaporet, the lid of the Aron. And if you have a look at the parish of Rashi there in Parsha Truma, he explains hakruvim dmut partsuf tinok lahem. They had the appearance of innocent, angelic children. Now this is not the only place in Chumash where we're told about kruvim. 
Kruvim are also featured in Parshat Breshet. There we are told, Vayashken mikedem legareid en et ha-kruvim et lat ha-kerev ha-mitaperchet. Lishmor et derech et zachayim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu established east of Eden, that's outside of paradise, et ha-kruvim, the cherubs, with a fiery, swiveling sword to protect the entrance into the garden so that nobody should come close ever more to the tree of life. And what does Rashi say there about HaKruvim? Rashi's comment is HaKruvim, Malachei Chabala, agents of destruction. So how is this possible? It's the same Rashi, it's the same Chumash, it's the same Kruvim. In Sefer Breshit, Malachei Chabala, they are agents of destruction. And in Sefer Shmot, Tmut Patsuf Tinok Lahem, they are angelic, pure beings. And I think we can answer this question with three words. And everything depends on these three words. And they are location, location, location. You can take a kruv, a cherub, place it, mikedem leganede, outside of paradise. Thank you. And in the postal lottery of life, it is possible that within that environment, it could be influenced in the course of time to be a negative force within our society. And then you can take the very same kruv and you can place it in the Kodesh HaKodashim in that pure environment and that kruv could attain the highest possible levels of Kedushah and Tahara. So much depends on location, on Chevra, of environment, of who you are with and what the influences of your life are. And I would like to congratulate the YU Torah Mitzion Kolel, which has established here in Chicago a Kodesh HaKodashim, a most wonderful environment within which the future adults of the city and elsewhere are able to benefit from outstanding role models, have such an incredible chevra, have such wonderful influence on their lives as a result of which they have incredible potential to grow up, to be responsible and outstanding members of Klal Yisrael. Hi, hello. I'm Rabbi Fry Mervis, Chief Rabbi of the Commonwealth. I'm delighted here to meet Rabbi Doug and I wish you all, all the very best. So much depends on Torah leading. Learning and therefore, Chazal commented with Talmud Torah Keneged Kulam, the study of Torah supersedes all. There's a beautiful Gemara in Masechet Sotad of Kaf Aleph Amud Aleph. There, the Torah brings the Pasuk, Kiner Mitzvah Torah Or. The performance of a mitzvah is like candlelight, and the study of Torah like daylight. Why? Why Kiner Mitzvah Torah Or? Explains the Gemara. Ma Mitzvah Magana Lefisha'a. Candlelight enables you to benefit from its light for an hour, for as long as the candle is burning. And then the candle's light is over and that's it. But daylight enables you to benefit from light continuously. A mitzvah is like candlelight. While you're engaged in the mitzvah, you're enthralled by it, you're inspired by it. And you're not going to be going off in order to do anything inappropriate. But once the performance of the mitzvah is over, that's it. It stops protecting you. Talmud Torah, however, is different. If you study an hour of Torah in a day, you internalize that knowledge, those values, and it accompanies you as part of your character through the rest of the day. It is like the sunlight of our lives. Torah transforms us and informs us and inspires us throughout our lives to be responsible people. There's a fascinating Gemara, Masechet Tanit of Zayin Amud Aleph. Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa Rami. Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa brought two different Pesukim, both of them from Sefer Yeshaya, which contradict each other. In one Pasuk we read, Hoi kol tzameh Whoever is thirsty, let them go to the water. The other Pasuk states, Likrat tzameh itayumai. Towards the thirsty, take the water. Throw the water at them. Hakeid <laughs> Sad says the Gemara. So, how is that possible, Sarabhanina Papa explains as follows 
Im Tamid Hagunhu, if we are talking about a good student, a self motivated student, one who is thirsting, then Likrat Samehi Tayumayim, take water to him. Vim Nav Tamid Hagunhu, but if he is not an outstanding student, is not motivated, is not interested, then Hoi Kol Samehi Lechulamayim. Let everyone who is thirsty go to the water, which is Torah. Now, as I was explaining this to you, surely it should be just the opposite. Surely those who are self-motivated and who are keen and who are interested, then let them go by themselves. They know where to find it. But those who are dis disinterested, we should run after them to take it to them. So the Maharaja explains as follows. The Maharaja says, the worst thing that one can do is to force Torah down the throats of others, to impose it on them. Rather, we need to make Talmud Torah appealing so that people will come towards it with enthusiasm and then once they're keen and interested, ah, we can throw everything we can at them. So therefore, we have to make Torah exciting and novel in order that those who currently are not availing of the opportunities will come forward by themselves. Likrat And hoikot sameh l'chulamayim. And the likrat that's what we do once they are already within the fold of the Beit Midrash. So from here we learn, therefore, that tactics are very important when it comes to Talmud Torah. And our tactical approach needs to match the era in which we are living. The very last of Tariyak Mitzvot is It's a mitzvah to write a Sefer Torah. And isn't it so beautiful to see how the Torah itself is described? This melody, this tune, this joyous narrative for life. Sima Befihem says the Torah. Place it in their mouths. That's a description of successful Talmud Torah. In his masterful Sefer, Bichtav Neriyahu, Rav Dezla asks, Why Sima Befihem? Why in their mouths? Not in their hearts, not in their minds. Why Befihem in their mouths? And he says, you know, when you're feeding an infant, you need to make the child interested in eating, so you play a game with the, in, with the infant. You hold the food in the spoon, you go round and round, a helicopter, a train, a this or that. The child will open his or her mouth, you put the food inside, and that's where you stop. Now they have to themselves swallow it. If you force it down their throat, they will reject it. Therefore the Torah says, Sima Befihem. Make the Torah appealing. Make it a joyous experience. Enable students to have fun during that journey of Torah discovery. Let them open their mouths in keen anticipation. Place it in their mouths. Simmer b'fihem. But don't force it down. Let them digest it. And once they do that, they will want more and more. And we are so blessed to have the ultimate product on earth. It's the real thing. It's HaTorah HaKadosha. And indeed we find that in the Kollel here in Chicago, the methodology that is used from what I understand is perfect <coughs> for our teenagers of today to make them keen, to make them interested, to enable them to become engaged enthusiastically of their own accord, and then to feed them the Torah study in the most healthy and successful manner. Until now, we've been speaking about Lilmod, the art of Torah study, the mitzvah of Torah study, and how it ennobles our lives. But in our dovering every morning, we go on to say, Ulilameit. Lilmod Ulilameit. Once you have studied and once you know, you have a responsibility to share it with others. And it is here that I believe that we have an enormous challenge within today's changing Jewish environment right around the globe. And in this regard, I would like to share with you, if you haven't ever heard about it, details of the Joshua Bell experiment. It happened in 2007. 
Gene Weingarten was a correspondent for the Washington Post. Every single day, he would use the same subway station in Washington, D.C. And he would pass by buskers, and he would notice that nobody ever stopped to take in the music that they were playing. Here or there, a few people would, while walking past, would put their hands in the pocket and throw a few cents in. But that was it. And suddenly he thought, what would happen if a well-renowned musician would be playing as a busker here in this subway? Would people stop? Would people appreciate the music? Would they continue to rush from where they're coming from or where they're going to? And this whole idea played on his mind until one day he knew that Joshua Bell, the renowned, outstanding, world-class violinist was playing in Washington. So he went to his editor-in-chief of the Washington Post and he said, I've got this idea, it's, it's a crazy idea, but how about doing it? Let's invite Joshua Bell to come along one morning to play in the subway and we'll rig up the whole place with video cameras and uh, hopefully it will go viral and let's see if he can bring the whole station to a standstill with his music. Editor-in-chief loved it, Bell was approached, thought it was a brilliant idea, he said, I'm game for it. And one Friday morning, he arrived early in the morning with his violin. And he was asked to bring the Stradiv Stradivarius that he always played on, probably the best known and most famous musical instrument in the world. Handcrafted by Antonio Stradivari himself in 1713, books have been written about this instrument, twice it has been stolen from its owners and then mysteriously returned to them. Bell purchased it in 1985 for three and a half million dollars, and he agreed. So he agreed to play the same music he was playing in the evenings in Washington for people who were paying more than a hundred dollars a seat in order to hear him. He would give the same concert, the essence of it. So there he was one Friday morning. And by the way, you can watch a YouTube video of it. Six and a half million people so far have watched it. And the entire 43 minutes of the performance you can see in two and a half fast-forwarded minutes. So ladies and gentlemen, this is what happened. An event where you had one of the greatest musicians of the world playing some of the greatest music ever composed on the greatest instrument of them all. During the 43 minutes, 1,079 people walked past. Seven people stopped. They looked, and then they walked on. One of the people who stopped was a lady. She stopped, and she screamed. She said, I saw you last night in a concert. And she didn't know what to do with herself. She took her hand in her pocket, and took out a $20 bill and put it in his <laughs> violin case. 29 people all together walked past him while walking, dropped some sense in his violin case. After 43 minutes, without anybody noticing, packed his violin away, counted the money, it was $32.07, and off he went. So Gene Weingarten wrote an article about the Joshua Bell experiment. For it, he won the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing in 2008. And in his outstanding article, his Muscona, his conclusion is that it all depends on context. If you see somebody in an expected context, you'll respond in a certain way. If you see the same thing in a, an unexpected context, you'll respond in a different way. I actually believe that our conclusion should be different. Because the Joshua Bell experiment is a metaphor for Jewish life today. Hashira Hazot. The Torah is the greatest melody of life that exists. There are people who pay thousands of dollars to study in yeshivot and in Batei Midrash, to sit at the feet of Gedolei Torah, to take in every single beautiful and majestic word of theirs because they appreciate that Tovli Torah Pichamel Feisa Havachesef. The Torah from the mouth of Akadosh Baruch Hu is of greater value than all the silver and gold in the world. And then there are others who walk right past and they don't even notice it. They might hear some sounds, no different from anything else that they have in their lives. 
They're oblivious to its beauty, to its majesty, to its relevance in our lives, to its empowering feature to enable us to have happiness and meaning in the only physical existence we have on earth. It's one and the same Torah, but different people respond to it in different ways. In Sefer Breshit we are told how Hagar and Ishmael were on the run. Avram Avinu had given them some water, but they, they ran out of water. They were thirsty. They knew that their time was up. Hagar hid the boy behind a bush. She went elsewhere because she, didn't, she couldn't bear to see him perish. And then the Torah says, Vayifkach Elokim et Eneha Vatere Ba'er Mayim. God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water right in front of her. We are not told that Akadosh Baruch Hu created a miracle of placing a well which hadn't been there before in front of her. No, the well was there all the time. God opened her eyes to enable her to see what was under her nose all the time. And surely that is a prime responsibility that we have today. Those of us who are involved in the Lilmot need to strive also to achieve the Lilamet, to open the eyes of our brethren who don't yet appreciate the glorious grandeur, majesty, and relevance of Torah in our lives. There's a Mishnah in Masechet Sota, Periktet Mishnah Tetzai. Simanim, signs are given for the footsteps of Mashiach. Some remarkable signs. Read that Mishnah. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Signs which resonate deeply with the times in which we're living right now. And one of those signs is Penei Hador Kifnei HaKelev. The appearance of that generation will be the appearance of a dog. What can the Mishnah mean? The Kotzka Rebbe explains. Penei, appearance, also means the leaders. Therefore, Penei Hadar, the leaders of that generation, the spiritual leaders, the Rabbanim, the Machanchim, Kifnei HaKelev. They will be like a dog. What's the pshat? The Kotzka explains. When a shepherd goes out to tend his flock, he takes with him a sheepdog. The role of the shepherd is to look after the sheep which are loyal to him, which stay with him, thirsting for water. So he will provide them with that water and with grass to graze and so on. The role of the sheepdog is to stand on the outside, on the periphery, to guarantee that all the sheep stay within the fold. And if a little shepherd starts to stray, he'll run after that sheep in order to bring it back. The Kotzka said, in our past, the role of the Rav and the Machanech has been to look after the sheep. Those who are loyal to us. Those who are not going to run away. Those who are totally committed. For them, we need shepherds to look after them and to provide them with all the Torah that is necessary to be Machazek. He says the time will come when we will need a different type of Jewish spiritual leader, of the sheep dogma, to keep Am Yisrael within the fold. The sign of success of the shepherd is when his Talmidim become rabbis, become a become Rashi Yeshiva, become great educators. The sign of success for the sheep dog is when his Talmidim marry under a chuppah, are loyal to Yiddishkeit. And I believe in our time, while we have some shuls and Batei Midrash in which we've got shepherds, and now we've got Kirov organizations in which we've got sheepdogs, actually we need to bring the two together, to fuse them, to be as one. And this is the role, I believe, of the congregational Rav today, and of Mechanchim, and of our Kolelim. We have to be equally devoted to those we see and those we don't see. 
those who are committed and those who are slipping away. Every single neshama is a precious part of Klal Yisrael. There is the most remarkable halacha in Shulchan Aruch Arachayim, Siman Kov Kavchet, relating to Birkat Kohanim. <laughs> the Mechal represents us with all kinds of permutations, numbers of Kohanim, Minyan, do they do them, do they not, how do they do them, and we're presented with the following fascinating scenario. If you've got a Beit Takneset Shekula Kohanim, a shul service where every single person there is a Kohen, if they are exactly ten, says the Mechaber, all ten, <laughs> all ten of them go up to the Duchan and they, they do it, they bless. Imagine this scenario. All the Kohanim up there, and the shul with empty seats, and they're Duchanim. So the Mechaber asks, <laughs> So who exactly are they blessing? And his answer is, <laughs> They're brethren in the fields. You see, in the previous halakha, the Shulchan Aruch tells us that the bracha of the Kohanim can permeate through pillars. So if a shul is so full and you can't be standing in front and you're stuck behind a pillar, it's okay. The bracha will get through the pillar. Here the Mechab is telling us that the bracha goes through hills, through mountains, through buildings. La'achehem shebasado to our brethren in the fields. And I believe that the pshat for us today is that while we are in shul and we are there to bless and to influence and to guide and to inspire, it should not only be for those in front of us, but we must be mindful as well. La'achenu, our brethren, who are in the fields, who are in shopping malls, who are on the golf course, or on the beach, and who knows elsewhere they might be. They're equally precious to us and to the future of Klan Yisrael. I feel so privileged to be in your midst tonight because you are a gathering of such incredible people, because you are dedicated to strengthen that link, to guarantee that Toro will burn so fiercely and proudly within the hearts and minds of our young people so that they will indeed pass it on faithfully to the generations to come. May God bless you all those who are teaching, those who are studying, those who are supporting, so that all your efforts will be richly rewarded. And may all of Klan Yisrael, thanks to Talmud Torah, which is Keneget Kulam, have a bright, happy, successful, and wonderful future. Thank you very much. Well, that's it. Here at the Crown Plaza in Rosemont, Illinois, I want to thank uh, Rabbi Ephraim Mervis, the Chief Rabbi of the British Commonwealth, for being with us. I want to wish a mazel tov to Rabbi Ruvain Brand and his wife, Dr. Nechama Brand. And I want to thank all of you for being with us. Remember, you can check out our website, www.tvrabbi.com, where you can also see former shows on the web. If you want to email anyone here today or us, Info at tvrabbit.com is the email address. I will be sure to forward them and make sure they get back to you. Hope to see you next time right here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. Shalom, everyone. You're going to get married or you're going to die. Going to see Rabbi Doug. Going to see Rabbi Doug. Going to see Rabbi Doug. Going to see Rabbi Doug on the TV tonight. This has been a Taped with Rabbi Doug production.